Good morning, men. How y'all doing today? Good. Isn't the Lord good? Let's give a hand for Jesus Christ. Let's give him all the glory. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. We just heard about the forgiveness of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. Let's pray to him, brothers. Father, we just heard about the best gift that any of us could ever have in this world or in this life, and that's forgiveness. At such a great cost, it was paid at the cross for us. Thank you for our brother, Pastor Jeff, who reminded us today of the twofold aspect of forgiveness. We all need it, and we all ought to give it lavishly. So may this time bring you all glory, honor, and praise in the name of Jesus Christ. And God's men said, Amen. 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 You could be seated. Excited to be with y'all. And uh, as I was sitting there and hearing uh, Pastor Jeff teach on the, just the wonderful forgiveness of God and how we all must give it lavishly, I'm mindful of how the Lord has been good to me. And as I share with you, I share this with my family, the best thing I could give to my children is Jesus. The best thing I could give to my loved ones is Jesus. The best thing that we could, and, and, I, and bear with me, my, my English is broken from time to time. <laughs> You'll hear me say a little slang. You may even hear me talk a little bit Southern speak. And that, all that to say is the Lord has been good to me. And I pray that something is said today in this time that encourages you to walk with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The real Jesus makes a real difference in your life. Can I get a witness in here? Maybe I'm just pre... I, I come from that tradition. If, if you agree with it, you might say amen. If, if not, that's fine. Jesus Christ promises to never to leave us nor forsake us. He's the most wonderful friend we could ever have, who's our Lord and our God. And what this world needs, what you and I need, is more of him. So we're going to lift him up this morning. Uh, Grateful to God for this wonderful church encounter, for your pastors, uh, for the invitation to be here, and was invited over and just meditating on this theme of charge. And by the way, let's give it up for the men that are up here chopping some wood. Man. Woo-wee. I'm trying to tell you. You know, it's fun to be able to get together and encourage each other and not take ourselves too serious, have a good time, but at the same time develop deep relationships that point us to Jesus Christ. When Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, he said, God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so just bear with me today, just by way of a topic, I'm going to be talking to you about spiritual brothers and fathers. And just to clarify that, when I say brother or father, someone who relates to you in those ways for the purpose to get you closer to Jesus Christ. I'm not using that in a worldly sense, but in the sense that there's some people, I'll just testify for myself, who by their influence, they brought and are continuing to encourage me to follow hard after Jesus Christ. I can give you some other examples that are the complete opposite. But for our time, we're going to look at some examples from Scripture. Uh, We'll see the example of Jonathan in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel 18. And we're going to see the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And if you have your Bibles, you can be turning there, put your finger there, and we're going to have it overhead. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you were born in the 2000s? Don't be shy. Let's give it up for our youngins, right? Give it up for them, all right? Okay. All right. Let's go back a little bit. Any 90s people born in the 90s? All right. Give it up for the 90s. All right. We're going to roll it back a little bit. Any 80s people born in the 80s? All right, we've got to give up for the 80s. All right, 70s kids. Any 70s? All right, I'm with you. I'm with you. The 70s. All right, and we're going to honor our, our esteemed brothers. Anybody between the 60s back to the 40s in the house? Let's give it up for our brothers. Yeah. All right. Everybody take note. These men have been around the corner. They've seen things more than one time. They're the ones that have sense in the room. So we're going to listen. We're going to learn from them a lot. Next slide. Now, we got some pictures here, spiritual brothers. That's where I'm going at the start. 
Now let's go to that next slide. Anybody see this one here? Now as a 70s kid, I remember watching a motorcyclist, a stunt man, and some of y'all know his name. His name was Evil what? Evil Knievel. Now you 20s and, and 90s, you're like, who's that? This guy would jump all kinds of stuff. So naturally, being a kid, we wanted to jump things too. And I was looking around for pictures, and by a show of hands, how many of you 70s and 60s folks had ramps and you tried to jump stuff? Yeah, there you go. Without a bike helmet, without pads. You know, I remember one time trying to jump it, and I didn't have enough momentum, and I got to the edge of it, and all of a sudden just came down, bike, you know, hit, hit me. Anyway, it was, it was a horrible thing. I'm going somewhere with this. Now, if it's wild to be the one to actually jump, what does it say about your friends that are willing to lay down on the ground? <laughs> yeah. So we did all kinds of stuff. And I remember the words of my mom regularly, go outside and play. Go outside and play. This is before video games and all that. Now, hey, why am, why am I saying this? There's something about when we have friends and community that pulls us out of ourself, gives us encouragement to try things, not necessarily always in a bad sense, but there's a sense of adventure, a sense of willingness to try. And it's nothing like having healthy friends that root for you and clap for you and say, hey, you could do this. Next slide. Now this, this picture up here says, when I was a kid, I rode my bike without a helmet and nothing is wrong with me. And you know what else? When I was a kid, I rode my bike without a helmet and there's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> that was my first of many dad jokes. So where's, where's my dad joke guy? <laughs> okay, so for some of us, you know, we're starting to feel those effects. Um, yeah, I like that picture. Next slide. Well, recently they had this show, Stranger Things, many of you saw, and I know it kind of took us back. You can give it up for that, that's fine. Yeah, and what I loved about it was seeing these guys on those huffy dirt bikes and being able to leave at the beginning of a Saturday, leave the house maybe 10 and be back before the lights or after the lights were on. So there was a lot of chance to really get into things or see things with your friends. And what I liked about the series was their commitment to each other and they were facing down some pretty hard stuff. And some of us, even as kids, have seen some things ourselves. I grew up in Long Branch, New Jersey. My father pastored the church there, and my first experiences with going into a hospital was taking with him, carrying his communion kit as we were visiting people that he knew and loved and we knew and loved. So I got to see my father who worked bivocationally. He was a bulldozer driver, and he also was a pastor. And so he'd come home from a hard day's work, shave, get cleaned up, and say, come on, Junior, we're going to the hospital. So we're going to see Sister Jenkins. We're going to see Deacon so -and So we're going to see these same people we saw on Sunday who are cafeteria workers, bus drivers, principal. And, and walking with my dad and seeing life through his perspective encouraged me as a father. But I also had friends that we remember when Alfredo drowned on the Jersey Shore. We remember seeing, oh, this shooting happened where they were dealing drugs. And we remember walking around the corner, seeing, uh oh, they're the hicks. You got to run. A bunch of bullies trying to rob you. <laughs> you know? So I bring this up because there's nothing like having friends that will commit to helping you get closer to God and being your best even during hard times. Next slide. And so I have a text of scripture, and we're going to talk about first spiritual brothers and this wonderful example in the life of one who we don't hear much about. His name is Jonathan. And the scriptures might be a little small there. We're at 1 Samuel 18, my apologies, 1 through 5. And I'm going to read this brief account from a narrative from the Old Testament, which is showing God at work in the life of David, bringing him up to be king over Israel. He's been anointed to be king, but here's this godly friend or who will become a brother to him who plays a role in his life and development. And so let's look at this, and I'm just going to jump right in there using these glasses that I now recently have to use. There you go. We're getting on in life. There you go. Uh, getting older. All right, one through five. Here we go. Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, 
and Jonathan loved him as himself. Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and his, and his, and his bow and his belt. Amen. Let me read on a, a little bit further. Bear with me. So David went out wherever Saul sent him. This verse uh, continuing on. Went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul set him over the men of war. And it was pleasing in the sight of all the people. Also in the sight of Saul's servant. servants. Well, here we look at a, a special friendship and a brotherhood between David and Jonathan. And often we don't hear much about the benefits of godly friendships. We have in scripture here a wonderful example of a true brotherhood. So much so, we see some things here about Jonathan are worth um, taking note of. Number one, after David, by God's help and strength and guidance, defeated Goliath, he's brought into the king's court. He doesn't get to go home. He's, he's a young guy. And here, Jonathan, if you read Samuel, and I encourage you in your own time, read the story. Jonathan is already a warrior. He's already fighting on the side of Israel. He's an outstanding man. And from a human perspective, he is a prince to, to the king, the king being Saul. And one of the first things I want to share with you about this example of a brother and a friend is the humility of Jonathan. Humility is one of these things that, quite frankly, in our society today, is not really encouraged. We live in a society that's about with them. Y'all know what the word with them means? This is dad joke number two. What's in it for me? <laughs> it's all about self. One of the most used words is selfie. And here you have this rising uh, uh, soldier who just defeated one of the champions of Israel who's basically a shepherd boy. He's not from royalty. He's at the palace. And, and, and Jonathan goes and shows kindness to him and gives him his robe, gives him his sword, his bow. David, good job out there. Let me give you these things. You know, let me help you out. Now, now this is foreign to our society because often people have a mindset that your success is somehow going to diminish me. Can we clap for other people? Can we applaud them as they're rising up? And this shows the character of Jonathan, because from a human perspective, he should be next in line to be king. But if you read the story, he knows that God chose David to be king and not him. So for all you spiritual brothers out there, as you see God blessing and using another brother, can we stand up and be like, yeah, man, I'm with you. Let's go. Let's go. You need anything? Let me give it to you. Let me help you out. Brother, here, get up over that wall and fight that fight. I'm on your side. And so one of the qualities we see, just as a narrative, this is a story, but it took some humility for Jonathan to invest in him at even his own expense. Amen. Let's go on a little bit further. It says that they, the, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. There's a sense of commitment that he had to the betterment of David. Can we think of people in our lives, I can think of a few, who, who in a godly way made a commitment for us to be where we are today? who loved us in the name of Jesus and said, you know what? I want to see you do well in life. I love you. You need anything. I'm here for you. My cousin, I have three big sisters. So, so many ways I was almost destined to be a mama's boy. <laughs> Vicki, 15 years older. She's in heaven. Michelle, six years older. She's in Oklahoma serving the Lord. My sister Charlene, who I have a picture of, she's in heaven. Love them dearly. But my older cousins were like big brothers to me. One by the name of Alan Golden. He might be, he might, Alan, we call him Big Al. I remember Al taking me to the beach. And I remember we were shooting hoops somewhere. He said, here, cuz, here's how you hold the basketball. Here, cuz, here's how you hold your hands. Here, cuz, he always was that guy. 
And when he gave his life to Christ, he's like, cuz, I'm praying for you. How's your family? He, I, you know, I'm, I'm 6'5", 240. But Al is, oh boy, this retired Air Force military police. He's got me by about four inches. He's still big Al to me. <laughs> and to this day, he, he ministers and talks to me like the big brother that he is. He says, cuz, you got a moment? I, I've been thinking about you. And he'll start asking questions and go deeper and deeper. And this investment that I'm talking about has blessed my life. And I'm literally standing here right now because of a godly brother like my cousin. Can you name that person who is that for you? Or if you've been walking with Christ, can, can you name who you are that too? Jonathan had a commitment to David, so much so that he made a covenant with God. Here's where it gets deep. He, it, this covenant between Jonathan and David, that friendship, and, and some scholars take it in weird places. They're like, you know what? This is a God thing. May God help me to be in your life for your betterment, because you're going to be king one day, David. You're going to be king, but I'm with you. And you see in the story of David, even after Jonathan dies, David looks for the family members of Jonathan because he wants to fulfill his oath to God to take care of his loved ones. Can we get an amen on that? So this is a spiritual brother. We see the humility of Jonathan. We see the commitment of Jonathan. But we also see this generosity in that he's giving of his own things to David so that he would win. And this is just observations here. This is a story. The real king behind the story and the leader behind the story is always the Lord. But notice that his place of, of um, generosity, if you will, as I said earlier, it doesn't diminish him at all. Now, if you have your Bibles and you read on a little bit further, I want you to take note of this. Verse 6, it happened as they were coming uh, when David returned from killing the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines and with joy and with musical instruments. The women sang as they played, watch this, and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Verse 8, then Saul became very angry for this saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands. Now what more can he but want but the kingdom? Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. Scripture would go on to say that Saul would actually become demonized. And so he has this eye of envy and jealousy. You know, he's, he's getting a praise that I ought to have. He's getting this accolades I ought to have. And he's the polar opposite of his son. One of the reasons why sometimes men get off by themselves is because sometimes we've been burned or we're in that place of unforgiveness or we're just in a place that's just sinful. We'll just call it as it is. But, but, but on the other hand, what would it look like to have a genuine relationship with God through Jesus Christ, to be forgiven and to be in a place of fullness so that in your abiding walk with Christ, you're not diminished by the success of others? And you have a sense of generosity, like, wow, God has, you know what? And I agree with you, Pastor Jeff, I, I, I don't have it all together. And I owe thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands, and that God would show me grace? How can I not show it to somebody else? Do your thing, brother. I'm rooting for you. Fantastic. And you give, you're able to give generously because you've received generously. Are you tracking with me? So this is the kind of friend and brother Jonathan is. Now, again, this is a story. Samuel's a narrative. We don't hear enough about Jonathan. Jonathan has the hard task of loving and honoring his father who's in a sinful state. Nowhere did he betray his father, who was the king, but was in a horrible, sinful state. And at the same time, he no way... Uh, betrayed David. Well, brothers, you and I can receive that. I hope that you have a Jonathan in your life who reflects that humility, who reflects that generosity, who reflects a willingness to submit to the will of God 
and committing to God's purpose, not only in their life, but your life too. Next slide. Have some more pictures overhead. I want to pivot towards spiritual fathers. And the scriptures are going to, we're going to look at in a moment. We'll give some examples. I, I know there were a number of brothers here. I said in the, who here, just by a show of hand, those who were born in, in the 60s, 50s, and 40s. Raise your hand. Let's give these men a hand. Yes, indeed. Amen. You know, I, I recall um, it was a, a brother who, oh boy, he's 102. This is down in Los Angeles. And it was, a, it was a service to honor him. And they, everybody was clapping for him. And he called his children to stage. And his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and people he had served the Lord with and had planted churches. And they shared stories. And he looked around and he looked at all of his family. He says, you know what? The best thing I would ever want to see in my life is to see all my children in heaven. He looked across the stage and my grandchildren. He says, I've seen some things, sometimes more than once, sometimes twice. He said, but what I want to most see is to see my kids walking with Jesus. And I said to myself, if I could see a hundred and some art, I want to say the same thing. And I'll say it now at 53. And so spiritual fathers, let's look at the a picture here. Now, who could recall that first shave? <laughs> Uh, if I say brow cream or if I say Gillette or Brute, some of y'all remember those. And I remember my pop, he used to use something called depilatory magic. I don't know if y'all know that. It, they kind of stir it up and you put it on and it was like acid and it burned. It. <laughs> some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I made the mistake of trying that out as a teenager and woo, it was burning hot. Well, you know, we learn a lot from fathers. Not just what they say, what they do, guiding us. You know, my pop, I remember when he was with us, he passed in 90, oh boy, 92. Uh, he was struggling with cancer, but one of the privileges I had was giving my pop a shave. And he and I would talk, we'd have a good time. So we learn from those fathers in our life. Next slide. 1 Corinthians 4.15. We're going to look at the Apostle Paul talking to some of his spiritual children. And I encourage you, you can read the book for yourself. This is just a little snapshot. This is a letter to Paul's spiritual children who are going through um, tough times. Verse 15, for if you were to have countless tutors, or your scriptures may say teachers or instructors in Christ, Yet you would not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. Amen. The gospel is good news. The gospel is good news that a holy, righteous, just, infinitely wise, powerful God who was offended because of my sin and your sin through our parents Adam and Eve and even in our own life, he is willing to deal with that sin by putting it on his son, Jesus Christ. The good news is, is that that sin that caused us to be separated from God, headed towards an eternal destiny in hell and in the lake of fire, there was one who was completely just, completely right, never did anything wrong, always good and righteous, came and said, I will pay the debt. He healed the sick, y'all. He raised the dead. He gave sight to the blind. He loved them to the very end. I'm talking about Jesus, y'all. This same Jesus went to the cross, and on the cross he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And when he said, it is finished, that the last I, he paid a debt that none of us could pay. And three days later, he rose again from the grave. Amen. This is the gospel. Are you happy about it? Am I just talking to myself up here? We serve a forgiving God. And this message is good news for those who recognize that they're sinners. I can't pay 16000 I can't pay it, but Jesus did. And lo and behold, he uses just the weakest and flimsiest of people. We have treasure in earthen vessels, a clay cracked pot. And if you're looking for one, just point right up on the stage. 
And then you could point it right back at yourself. <laughs> because the glory belongs to him. So the apostle Paul, the man who had played a part in the stoning and murder of Stephen, is on fire with the message and he's walking through villages all through the ancient world sharing this good news. Some receiving it, some running around, and he makes his place to Corinth, pagan city, got a whole bunch of things going on. The message is received and the Lord begins a powerful, radical transformation. Lives are being changed, transformed, but this church has some issues, just like my family and yours. <laughs> and he writes a letter to the Corinthians because they've got some issues going on that are sinful. And he's writing to them, not so much like I'm here to chide you and put you down. He's like, I love you like a father. That's the tenor of this message. And he says this, you're going to have many guardians, instructors, teachers that will just jump up, tell you what to do, but you're not going to have many fathers. And the beauty of that is God will use him to not only bring them to Christ, but also to bring correction. Who can call you up and correct you? Who can call you up who's alive today and be like, you know, um, brother so-and-so, I, I love you. I need to meet with you. Let's have some coffee. But you know, where, you working today? What time is your lunch? Can I come by? Um, your wife gave me a call and, you know, we were having a barbecue and, and I understand things got really messy the other night. I love you, man. Let's take some time. Can you, y'all getting kind of quiet on me. <laughs> you can receive that from somebody who's like a father. It's hard to receive it if we're not fatherly or receiving, if there's no relationship there. I, I mentioned to you my cousin Al. There's a few others, but he's on my call list. And my wife knows a few of them. If the, Paul is being used by God to father them. And in this, this and, and, and I'm just not, just can't go as deep as I want to, but he uses his example and character as an encouragement. Not from a, a haughty place, but he tells them, follow me as I follow Christ. There's a sense that a father, just like somebody that shows you how to shave, is also going to encourage you in the Christian life. Encourage you, hey, you know, I know you're parenting now. You're going through a tough time. Uh, can we talk about it? And maybe there's some things I can share with you and I can learn from you as well. He gives his example. But then Paul also in his character of faithfulness, even enduring suffering, becomes a model for the church in Corinth to follow. Paul would go on and point out his son in the faith, Timothy. He's like, I'm going to send you my son in the faith, Timothy, who's faithful. And oftentimes, many of the letters in the New Testament, you'll see Paul and Timothy and Paul and Titus, and you see God using different people who Paul himself would be a spiritual father to. Here's the thing. Today, Many times, men in our society, we're by ourselves. We're alone. We don't have community. And we get off by ourselves and we get in trouble. You see those, anybody like watching those uh, uh, National Geographic when animals attack kind of stuff? <laughs> you know, the lion's not just going to go after that big herd of buffalo in mass, but they'll wait for that one that's all by themselves, that stray, and then pounce. And we have an enemy. Satan, the evil one, the devil, who goes about like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. The good news is, my brother, by faith in Jesus Christ, we have all that we need in him to be encouraged and to encourage others. Amen? Amen. Next slide, if you will. Now, many moons ago when I had some hair, <laughs> that fellow there in the middle, that's me with my big sister Charlene, who went to be with Jesus about two years ago. Love her dearly. Um, Charlene had battled with depression for years, but she's not battling with it now. And that little fella right there, he's 33 years old. His name is Michael. And, uh, you know, it's funny. That, that picture's kind of beat up, but the, hey, next slide. So here's Michael. This picture's a little older. He's serving in the United States Army. And he's a sergeant in the Army, and he's done 
several tours around the world. He's off doing his thing. And uh, I love that guy. I love him like my own son. And as I was joking around with Pastor Jeff, it's an interesting thing to think that somebody who you put diapers on can kill you in multiple ways. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I pray for him. I've shared the gospel with him. He's heard the truth. I encourage him to surrender his life to Jesus. He knows he can call me at any time. I love me some Michael. Next slide. I'm a dad. I'm a husband. That beautiful woman in the middle, her name is Norlin Rochelle Clemens, married 27 years. And boy, yeah, that's right. Give it up for her. Around the table, my oldest Charles to her, her, her right or our left, that fella there. And then there's Layla up front, Big Joe there at the front, and then Skippy. He didn't like it. That's his nickname, John, immediately close to me. So these are my children and my dear wife. And brothers, you may or may not have a family. You may or not have biological children, but you can be a spiritual father. If you're in Christ and you're walking with the Lord, you can be a father to someone who who wants and needs it. Um, When I was having hard times with my oldest and was about going through a really tough spot, the sergeant comes to town and has conversations with his younger siblings. (laughs) And I was amazed at the things that he could say to them that I couldn't say to them. Because he had a different experience with me. He's like, you know, if I hear Uncle Charles telling me that you're giving him a <laughs> And he was lighting them up. And I'm like, I'm like, this guy? <laughs> we are a family. Next slide. And in Christ, oh, go back, go back. I'm sorry. Go back to, to, to Mike. Paul poured into Timothy for the purpose of advancing the gospel. And as I come to a close and just... I want to give you some thoughts. The first is this. Do you have spiritual brothers and fathers in your life? Who are they? Who is that brother who cheers for you and claps for you and roots you on, whether it's telling a dad joke or chopping wood or showing up, hey, we're going to do some community work here, and and who you can really genuinely talk to has shown themselves to be humble enough to clap for you and also generous that, hey, if you need help, I'm there for you. Who are those spiritual friends that are real brothers? Do you have a spiritual father in your life? You know, we often hear about the importance of discipleship. Who is that person that helps guide you towards a closer walk with Christ and has close enough connection to you that they can have the hard conversations as well as clap for you and say, that's my boy. I'm so proud of him. Who are those? And then lastly, who are you a spiritual brother to? No matter what age, who are you a spiritual brother to? What kind of friend and brother are you? And, and, and from what I see, and I've, I've, we had great times. I I've, I've know Clint's here somewhere, Lake Nasi, just to see the brotherhood there. Brothers getting together to abide and have a walk with Christ. That impacts everything. So who are you a brother to? Or who are you a spiritual father to? Here's the thing. It all starts with Jesus Christ. It all starts with Jesus. I hope and pray that whatever area of life that you are in, you might be going through a tough time. David literally went from fighting a a giant, which in and of itself was big, so now he's whisked away from his home life, he's brought into the palace, no so long, mom or dad, no see you later. Now he's taken up residence somewhere foreign, all by himself, and has a friend there who has a genuine walk with God and says, hey, I'm committed to you too. And then Paul used of God to usher in the greatest message that any world and any person could ever hear or know about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so brothers, as I come to a close, just... Um, We need that today. If you don't have it, seek it out. Hear it and counter. Or whatever church you're at, seek it out. If If the gospel is preached in any community, it's definitely preached here. Go on and seek it out. Have that brotherhood. 
And if you are walked along in life, and brothers, I want to speak to the spiritual fathers. You may be the one to help guide that brother who's struggling. Say, hey, you know, have you made a will? And how are you going to take care of your family? I, I did mine several years ago. Let me show you. Help walk them through the basics. It might even be showing how to change the oil or change a flat. It may seem like something that's natural to you. But I, I won't ask, but many of us here didn't have fathers in, in our life. And we feel ashamed about asking somebody some basic things like, how do I do this? And so the gospel applied can be really practical. Brothers, I hope I didn't nerd out on you up here. <laughs> but our God is so good that he walks with us every step of the way. As I come to a close, when Jesus had preached to the people and disciples were like, send them away. Jesus said, no, you feed them lest they faint along the way. And for my brothers here, I pray that a spiritual brother and father who gets you closer to Jesus gives you everything you need for your journey. Let's pray. God, you have been so good to us. Thank you for your love that you lavish on us. Oh, it's, it's a huge waterfall flowing. We don't deserve it, but we say thank you, Jesus. We ask your blessings on the men here, the families represented, the younger men, the older men, and all in between. Make us to be the men you have us to be, and it all starts at the cross. And so today, may this be the day of a closer walk as brothers and fathers in your sight that glorify your name. In the name of Jesus Christ and God's men said amen. 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 God bless you. Walk with Jesus. <laughs>